interesting. The book of Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. These beautiful spring days, uh, I don't know why, but sometimes when we get to the evening service, you seem to be tired and quiet. And uh, that's one of those nights tonight you seem to be very well-mannered and very spiritual and very quiet. Unless I say something pretty exciting, I feel like every one of you are going to sleep on me. Amen? The book of Mark, chapter 12. Mark, chapter 12. Verse 28. <clears throat> As we look to our Lord's word. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Lord... Which is the first commandment of all? Which is the biggest, the best, the first one? What is the one? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is another commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is, there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that does ask him any questions. Would you please pray with me softly, and then we'll go to our, the word of message. Now, Father in heaven, I would pray now that your visit of the Spirit of God would be with us this hour, and take us as your people to this truth. Help us to understand your word and this message. And we'll love you and thank you in Jesus' name. We ask and pray, and amen. You know, I think to understand love is really an important part of our lives. I'm not exactly sure, I'm not exactly sure that we as people sometimes understand what really love is all about. If we're talking about our love for the Lord, I think we need to understand what it is. The world's definition of love, according to the Webster Collegian Dictionary, says that love is a feeling of a deep affection. Now, now get what I'm saying here. It's a feeling of deep affection. It goes on to say, in understanding the definition of love, it's a deep romantic or sexual attraction. Now, now think with me about the world definition. But how in the world does that compare to what God really talks about? Okay, when we talk about loving the Lord... Does that mean that we got to have a deep emotional affection? Uh, is it involved with our flesh only? Where in what is this? You know, the New Testament gives a specific meaning, if you please, of the word love. And you know, the English, when you translate the Greek, the Greek uses a couple different words that describe love for us. One is agape love. It means the affection. It means to be benevolent. It means to be of goodwill. It means to be of high esteem, to hold one. It means to have a concern for. It means to have a welfare of the loved ones. It means to be deliberate and purposeful in your expression. It, uh, it has nothing to do with emotion or impulse or sexual feeling. Uh, in the Bible, we find that gopi love is translated charity. There's another word in the New Testament as well that reflects to us, my friend, the definition of the Bible understanding of the word love, and that's the word phileo. It's an impulsive, it's an emotional feeling. It's, uh, it's like the love between two brothers or two sisters. But there's a difference in degrees of that love. One is more on the other side of the world side, if it's the, the emotional feelings, it's the impulses that we have to do. Or on the other side, my friend, the agape love, that's the deep, the true, the affectionate, the benevolent, the, the concern and goodwill for others, the 
the high esteem, holdings, that's love. It's a concern for. It's, it's a welfare, my friend, of someone else. It's deliberate, purposed affection and movement of your life that you might touch them. Now, as we think about this love, we must understand that as we talk about the questions of how we love the Lord, um, I think it's very important for us to understand what love is. Um, probably, unless you're a Christian, we probably find it difficult to define find love. Many Christians don't understand really love. They really, really can't comprehend it, nor they understand it. Um, Christians will become involved in service because of excitement or an emotional impulse or uh, you're moved by a certain story or you're moved in your motion and because of that, that moves your, your love and you respond by a gift, you respond by giving or doing or caring or whatever that might be. But it's, it's that love that comes because of an emotion and impulse um, and, and, it's, and we're moved sometimes that way. But God says that there's something more than that. There's a different level of love, and it's not the phileo, it's agape love, the love like God has, that's, that's different than an emotional impulse or feeling or a drive or a draw or attraction to. Um, you know, I think so many of us, when we've seen our wives and we were attracted to them and, and perhaps attracted with their eye, that doesn't mean that we are loved them. We, we might have said that then, that we loved them, but it was, a, we were loved to the attraction. A couple had broken up and, and, uh, the wife was just honest, this is, a, this is a deliberate true story, and said, you know, I just want to know why, why we couldn't make it work. And the man said, I think I loved your body more than I loved you. Now, what I'm telling you is the world definition of love is a lot different than the Bible definition of love and what really is. Now, I ask you this, this question tonight, do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Does the Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church, do we love the Lord? Now. Uh, I'm not asking you, are we phileoing it? Are we moved at, by impulse? Are we moved by emotion? Are we spurred of the excitement of a moment or the challenge that's given to us? And do we respond by that? Or is there a different level? Is there a different depth? Um, are you um, on the level of the phileo love or are the agape love? Are you, uh, where, where are you at in your love for your neighbor and for your enemy and for your Lord? Where are you at? Where are you at? If we're going to talk about having a love offering, it'd be one thing if you just had the word offering, but when you put the love in front of it, when we're challenging our people to give because of their love, it really changes everything that we say. And I guess if we were to try to understand it, it means that my friend will understand that we, we need to be able to measure our love by what we do with our lives. And you know, we'd be able to tell who we are and what we are. Love is an attribute of God and it's a part of his very nature, amen? God is love, amen? The Gospel of Luke chapter 12 talks about five sparrows sold for two farthings. And it talks about those, and the Father says uh, that not one of them is forgotten. Not one of them is forgotten. And he said, you're much more valuable to him than simple little tiny beautiful birds, you know. But he said, now, that's who I am that I have a compassion even for the simplest little sparrow. And it was in that text as well that he said, you know, I love you so much that even the hairs of your head are numbered. Amen. In Matthew chapter number five, the Bible said, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. God's love, my friend, is because of who he is, not because of who we are. You see, he sent the sun and he sent the rain on those that are godly and good and those that praise him and those that curse him just the same. So the love, the attribute of God was consistent and the same, my friend, in that day. The, uh, the culture and the day of this New Testament that we know and the culture of the Savior's day was a culture that if there was somebody that was looked at as a sinner and uh, you, were a, you were a proper person that you'd look down upon them, it was, it was a very common practice for on purpose for people to ignore other people that they'd look at and esteem them as being lower than they are sinners. And so they would literally, my friend, despise them and not show any affection or emotion to them. They would look away and not focus with them or focus on them. And God was trying to teach them as he would try to teach us that love is an attribute not only of God, but it's a love is an attribute that you and I need to have in our lives. 
Jesus said our most important responsibility is, my friend, that we as men, that we had loved the Lord God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. He said that's the very first and the most important thing that you and I do with all of our life. Now let me ask you, are you a, are you a Christian that, that moves by an impulse, by emotion, by feeling, by a story, by something you hear, by something you see? Or is there something much deeper than that? You understand about God's love. God's love, my friend, again, was not based on the one that's being loved. It was based on the one that was doing the loving. You know, we demonstrate our love by keeping his commandments, the Bible says. If you love me, then you're going to do something. And you're going to keep my commandments. Keep the commandments not because we're excited, not because we've been moved by emotion, not because we have some kind of an impulse, not because there's some kind of an excitement. But he said, now, if you have this love right in you, then, my friend, one thing that you'll do, and that is that, is that you will keep my commandments. He said that love is so very important. You know, I think that we must realize our love does not come out of our emotions. I think some love comes out of our emotions. Don't you think so? You know, I think some of that and levels of our love comes out of emotion or feeling or attraction. When someone's good to me, I'm, I, I'm grateful to them. I love them. And you respond the same way, right? Amen. That's the emotion. That's the impulse. That's the fleshly or the world definition or the world way that we respond. And so if someone's just the other way, you know, if they're just, uh, if they're not kind, but they're, they're mean and they're not, uh, they're, they're just not the way they need to be to you. It's, it's very difficult to love those people. Can you say amen with me? Amen. Now that's because we're functioning, my friend, out of the world part of us, the world love part of us, the phileo part. The part, my friend, uh, that, that responds out of affection, of feeling and emotion. Um, I think I respond to my wife that way. I think you respond to, gentlemen, your wife. Uh, ladies, I think you respond to your husband that way. If he's kind of grouchy that day, your response might not be so loving because you're responding out of the different level of love. That part, my friend, that deals with the emotion, the part that deals with impulse. You know, you know sometimes I think our love is, is based not out of our love for him, but it's based, my friend, about a reaction of something we believe that he's done for us. Go with me to the book of 1 John chapter 4. And some of you know this this verse and these verses there is quite an exhortation and study in first john chapter 4 just as it talks about love but we're going to just point to you one one truth as we make our way there in verse number 10. he said you want to know where it is and what it is you want to know what love is herein is love not that we love god he said now that's not really love for you and i to love God. You want to know the highest level of love, and here it is. Here in this love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He said, your love is for the Lord is not a reactionary emotional love because He's done something kind of good for you. He said, here, is, here in His love, here's the highest level, the agape love. It's a love, my friend, when you are unlovable and uh, you have never served him and you never lived for him and you didn't care about him and you lived your whole life in control of yourself and, and you have just did that in your own will. He said, here in his love, not that you love God because he's good to you, but my friend, here is love that God loved you when you didn't do good for him. That's what really love, what real love. It's a love, my friend, that's not based on impulse. It's not based on emotion, but it's based on the fact, my friend, that you have chosen your heart on purpose to love someone, to care about somebody, to show up benevolence or, or affection, or you had held them in high esteem, or you had concern for them, and you had concern for their welfare, and uh, you were deliberate and purposeful and choose on purpose to care for somebody. That's what real love is. Can you say amen with me? Amen. amen. If you don't love him, if it's only an emotional response, and it's not, my friend, it's not a, a deep sense of feeling of doing right and doing what you should do, and it's only based on emotion, then you'll be just like a roller coaster. You'll be just up and down. You know, the feelings in life change 
And uh, when they do, if you're a person that only loves because someone loves you, or uh, they excite you, or they emotionally move you, or you're impulsive, and that's the only way you love, then, then, then in a few years your marriage will be flat, or and whatever else can happen in that, because the wrong base is the wrong foundation. The genuine and real love is the love that glues and keeps relationships of husband and wife and families and children and friends and churches together. Um, feelings in life, they change, and when they do, then real love needs to be in place. You know what? We must not depend on our emotional feelings to be our, mo our motivation. But we must come to realize that there's something much more than that, something deeper than that, something more real than that. And so we must not only be moved, my friend, when our feelings are right. I, I'm just like you. I have real emotions, and so do you. But my friend, sometimes my emotions, I don't know what happens to them, but they just don't work well. You know what I'm trying to say? They just don't move right. They just don't have the right feelings. They just are not right. And part of me is being broken as well, that part. And so if, we're, if we're only depending on what we're going to do for the Lord because of the emotions and not because of real genuine love, then my friend, we'll never understand the, the direction, the journey of life. You know, without understanding and mastering love, we are not really prepared for life. There's nothing, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, would you go there? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Unless you and I learn to master our love and not just be an emotionally and responsive move, responsibly moved, my friend, by our impulses, my friend, then no matter who we are, or what we've done, or how spiritually we appear, my friend, we've not graduated to that level of really, really being able to love. Another word in the New Testament the English language um, takes these, these words that are different levels of love and it doesn't give us complete and clear understanding of it, but look what it says here in chapter 1 and verse 1 of chapter 13. Chapter 13, 1. And though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love or charity, I become as a sounding brass and as a or, or a tinkling cymbal. He said, now, no matter how many spiritual gifts you've been given and you can speak in tongues, if you have all of that and if you don't, if you never graduate the way to the place beyond the impulse and emotion and feeling and you, you've come to be like unto God to know and to learn how to love, then, then you have wasted good sounds. Verse number two. And Paul said, though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, said, you're nothing. You have never, you've never grown to the place to get a hold, my friend, of, of the real understanding of love. Verse 3. And he said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. He said, now, unless you get a hold in the understanding of love, the scriptural, the biblical plan of love, and get a hold of that, then all you do doesn't make any difference. Verse 4. Charity, what it does, it suffers long. It's kind. Envieth not, it doesn't crave what others have. Bonneth not herself, doesn't puff herself up, doesn't make herself bigger than she is. It's not puffed up. Verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiced, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, it endureth all things. Charity never failed, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, or there be tongues, they're going to stop, they're going to cease. And whether there be tongues, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. What I'm telling you tonight is not only, my friend, love the first commandment, but it's something that God wants you and I to learn to get a hold of and allow it to be a part of our real life. You know, we are made to be objects. I'm turning my corner now. We are made to be objects of someone else's love. Amen? Now, let me, let me make this sense, okay? Can you quote the verse with me? For God so loved the world. Are you ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
that believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God has created us that we're to be made and be the object of God's love. Can you say amen with that? Amen. But let me go farther. We are made and we only function as we can and should if we're loved by some, someone else. We're loved by others. Husbands, Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives. Interesting. How much and how far and how long? And if she's cranky, Lord, or if she's just being hard to get along. Lord, how, how long and how? Husbands love your wife, even as Christ also gave himself for it. It's very interesting that we're made to be objects that are loved not only by God, but we're made to be objects that were loved by others. Not, what, not that we're to be loved, my friend, without common sense, but love with, with, with knowing, my friend, that, there, that there's no conditions. It's a binding love between a, one person to another. You know, I, I would like to think that my friends would know that they're loved. And they're not loved because of who I am, excuse me, because of who they are, but because of who I am. And you know, we can love people and they can become the object of our love and the affection and we can on purpose hold them in high esteem. We can, we can hope and pray for goodwill for them. We can show affection and benevolence. We can be concerned about their welfare. We can be deliberate and purposeful and showing our concern and our response to him. We can do that and God wants us to do that. I'm saying that we are made to be an object of someone else's love and we're, to be, we're made to be lovers of other people. And you know what? You and I need to learn how to love others. The Lord said now, you had heard it said in the law uh, that you should hate your enemies and love your neighbors. But I say unto you that you as well should love what? You should love your, you should love your enemies as well. You know, God makes us an object of his love, not because of what we do or who we are, but because who he is and what he sees in us and what his love for us can do. You take God's love away from you, you take it out of your life, you take that away from you, what he's done for you on the cross, what he's done for you since you've been saved. God didn't just save us as sinners. God, God molds and makes our lives every day. And you take all of those touches from God, not only the salvation, but you take all those touches of God away. And my friend, you'll be a complete and an entirely different person. And so would any of us that have been saved any length of time. <coughs> Can I say that you and I have been made by the very hand of God, not only to be the object of his love, but now to become the lovers just like he is. Now, now think with me for just a minute. <clears throat> At what level is your love for the Lord? <clears throat> is it emotional? Is it a, is it a love that's impulsive? Is it a love that's based on feeling? Yeah, I'll read my Bible if, yes, I'll come to church if, I will do this, if you do this, Lord, I'll do this if, if I feel, if I'm moved, if I'm impulsive, if my emotions are right, and then I will, then I will, then I will, Lord. At what level? The book of John, our last visit of place of scripture, chapter 21, and we find now that it's a third time after the resurrection that Jesus now is presenting himself to his disciples. And as he often does, he questions Christians. Not that he might find out where they are, but that they might be able to find out where they are. He wanted them to know where they were spiritually. He wanted them to figure that out. And so it was in this setting. The man had become quite confused. They'd gone back and got out the boats and fixed the nets and they went to the water. And the Lord comes on the shore and invites them to come. And as they get to the shore, there was a fire of coals and there was fish and bread thereon and he feeds them. And then he begins to talk to them. And then he begins to question that one Peter about his spiritual condition. And we pick up in this read in verse 12 of John 21. And Jesus said unto them, come and dine, come on. And none of the disciples just ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord, because everybody knew. 
Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish and likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. And after that, he was seen from the, that he was risen from the dead. And so when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Hey, Simon, son of Jonas, he went back not to his, not to his spiritual name, but his carnal name, his old name, his world name. Simon, worldly man, fleshly man, a man that went back to his own ways, his old ways. Simon, lovest thou me? And if you'd read that word and understand that, you find that he's, the Lord is talking about the high level of love, not a love that's made out of emotion or impulse or feeling or excitement. Simon, are you going to love me after the cross? Are you going to love me after they crucify me? Simon, are you going to love me when the rubber hits the road? Are you, how are you doing, Pete? Hey, Simon, how are you doing? Lovest thou me more than these? It's very interesting, the Lord's question here. Uh, we've all tried to determine who are these, these that he talks about. Simon, do you love me more than these? Did the Lord point to the other disciples, the fishermen? that were a part of his crew, that were a part of the business? Did he point to the nets? Did he point to the boat? Did he point to the fishes? Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than these men that you, 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 you love and you're in business with? Do you love me more than these boats? Do you love me more than these waves, Peter? And as God does, he always makes a comparable. He makes a comparison so that we can understand where we're at. He said, now, do you, do you love me? Do you love me? You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier getting up to go on a turkey hunt at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning than getting up to go to a hospital and catch somebody in Columbus at 6.30 in the morning. It's always easier that. Does that, that make sense to all of us? Are you with me? And I don't know what is those things that maybe you would like or you would, But the Lord said, now, do you love me more than you? Do you love me more than these things in life? Do you, do you love me enough? Peter, do you, do you love me more than these? And he made the comparable. And he said, now, Peter, do you agape love me? Excuse me, uh, agape love me. Do you, do you love me with all of your heart? Are you beyond the emotion of the impulse? Peter, how much do you really love me? Or is that just impulsive, um, hit and miss? Is it all about your feelings, Peter? Is it just how you're feeling today? Is that how you're going to be? Peter, is that going to be your life? Is that the level you're going to stay at? Is that the place you're going to be at? Is that the way you're going to live at? I can see him pointing to those C's. I can see him putting his finger and pointing him things at my life. Pete, Dan Lamb, do you love me more than this? And do you love me more than that? Do you love me more than this? Dan Lamb, are you going to be an impulsive believer? Are you going to just love me when? When it's easier? When it's difficult? When, when the storms of life are there? Are you going to love me as well? Are you going to love me at all? The, what, is it, are you going to be an emotional, feely, squealy kind of a person? You, you know, and... and if it's not feely squealy, it's not emotion and high intense and, and uh, uh, dramatic, uh, then, then there's no, no response. If it's not the first time, it's the second or the third or the fourth, then, then people, they lose it because, my friend, they're not at the love where they need to be. Are you with me? Can you say amen? amen. Notice what else he said. Verse 15, I read the rest of it. And he said unto him, Peter answers now, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you know us, that I love thee. And he said unto them, unto him, then feed my lambs, feed the babies. And he said unto him again the second time, he uses that big word again, that full love, not the emotional love, but the real deep love, the commitment love, the love that's sincere, the love that's real, that's love that's beyond feeling, the love that's filled with understanding and compassion. And he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Then feed my sheep. He said, Peter, you tell me you love me, but you're telling you love me with, with a small love, like a brother to a brother, a sister to a sister, a friend to a friend. Peter, I, I know you love me like that, but Peter, I want you to go to another level. I want you to love me when there's no comparison of these to comparison of your love with me. Peter, I don't want to have a relationship of of a friend that you have with another. I want to have a different level in a different place. And then verse 17, and he saith unto him the, the third time, Simon, he doesn't use his spiritual name. He uses his old name. 
He doesn't use the name that was given to him because of his spiritual stand. He does not. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto the Lord, Thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Then Jesus said unto him, Then feed my sheep. It's very interesting that Jesus put the test to Peter's love so he could understand really and where he was. And when the Lord got a hold of Peter's heart and Peter realized that he was not where he needed to be doing what he needed to be doing, Peter then became a new man and a changed man. <clears throat> I conclude by saying a couple things. First of all, I say that you and I are made to be the people who know how to really love beyond impulse, beyond emotion, beyond feeling. You and I are made to be able to love people that are unlovely, rather they're a neighbor or an enemy or a brother or a sister or a husband or a wife or a sibling or another Christian. And that's what God calls you and I to do. God calls us that we, we would be the ones, my friend, that would know how to love, as the world might say, through the thick and thin, to the good and the bad, to the easy and hard. Yes, I think that we need to use, my friend, the afflato love when it's there, if we are impulsed or moved or, or emotionally, I think we ought to use that love, but we must not stop there. We must go beyond that to the agape love and become the lover as of God. And you know, it's interesting that God, without question, wants you and I to become exactly like Him. Though it is an attribute of Him that God truly and completely is love, but that's what He would make me and that's what He would make you. And so, for just to take an offering for our Lord's house would be one thing, but to take an offering because we love Him, that's a different challenge. That's a different challenge. A lot of years ago, we were still on Rhodes Lane, so that's just been 25 years ago, so it's a long time ago. One of our pastor friends, his son, Gene Wolfenbarger's son was a jeweler, and, and I was kind of looking for something very special for Suge and told him to watch, and he called me one day and he said, I have repoed a real nice ring, and uh, my dad thinks a lot about you, and so here's the deal. And he said, I'll send it down, and if your wife don't like it, you can just send it back. That was the first mistake I made because there's not a ring that has a stone on it that a woman don't like. Amen. I don't care what it looks like. It makes no difference. I've never heard of this happen. I guess it happens, but for some reason it was delivered on a Sunday. And they called me at the house and we lived on Rhodes Lane there, so I come over and got it. The kids were little and running around the house and I took her back in the bedroom and I put on her a big old story, man. I put a big story onto her. I asked her to close her eyes and I pulled out of that ring out of my pocket and put it on her finger and she hugged me and I thought she's romantically in love with me because I gave her that ring. Years gone by and the truth finally comes out, she was putting her hands around behind me to see if it was really real or not. That's what she would do. <laughs> Boy, that guy feels, makes a guy feel real good. She later told me that after I put that big story of love on her, she thought that I'd found it in the parking lot. It was one of them 25 centers, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> She was trying to get her, <laughs> man, I'll tell you what, you get a good man, he does good stuff and they still don't trust you. You got to prove yourself all the way. Amen. What I'm telling you is this, is that was probably one of the few times that I ever, ever sacrificed for Shuck, really. Probably one of the few times ever I did, ever, ever I did, really, just for her, just because of something I wanted to do for her, not, not because she needed it, she didn't need it. It wasn't her that needed it, it was me that needed to give it. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. I think God takes us to different levels and I think he takes this church and I think he takes us to a, pe a people that place where we say, okay now, are we gonna live on the emotional, feely, kind of squealy, impulsive kind of way of a Christian life? Or are we gonna go to a different level and become the lover that God wants us to be? And so that we honestly and sincerely and in a genuine way, can be compassionate and concerned about those people that are not lovely, that are not beautiful and kind and tender to us, but we become who we need to be by following who He is and becoming more like Him. So when we talk about a love offering, 
be so easy just to talk about an offering, but when you talk about a love offering, I can remember I bought a first Benelli rifle, I, a shotgun, I sold it. Benelli's I high end, a guy bought it and got in trouble, had a bail out of it, and so I got it almost a half price. Kept it for 15 years and shot it a whole big bunch and sold it for exactly what I had in it. But a Benelli's a super gun. It doesn't make you shoot any straighter, but it's just a super gun. A, tenest, a test of a Benelli gun is you can take it and hold it up and pull the trigger, and as fast as you pull the trigger, it should completely empty itself before the first shell hits the ground. So it's a high level gun. It's really a nice gun. I didn't shoot any better, so I sold it. Do you understand that? But where I'm going with that, as you know, I'll do things for things that I'm emotionally involved with or I love. Can I say I love that? I love those. And can I, can I say that I want you to really pray, prayerfully consider loving the Lord this time. I mean, I mean, praying about really doing for something for him that you do not for any other reason except for one thing, and that is because of your love for him. And you know, when we come to that place, when God can show us exactly what we need to do in the heart, a person's come to a, they become to a different person. And so they're walking down the journey of life and their feelings change and life changes your feeling and your emotions and and. And no longer are you waiting on that emotion to motivate you and push you and move you and excite you and impulse you. Now you're, you're consciously, maturely growing like Peter did. God said, now, now, Peter, do you love me with all of your heart? Do you agape love me or do you phileo love me? Do you love me emotionally, impulsively? What are you going to do, Pete? What are you going to do, bud? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You see, the Lord called him his old name. When John records it, he calls him by his new name. And when he tells the story what Peter's response was and how that he was, he was upset at the Lord because he asked him the question. You see, the world, the world seen Peter as being very spiritual and very strong. He was the leader of the 12. There's no doubt about that. But it's very interesting. It's interesting that the way the world seen Peter and the way the Lord seen Peter was completely different. And the Lord sees us as we really are. And sometimes he said, not agape, bud, phileo, like a friend, an emotional person, a person that's caught up with um, impulsive living, impulsive attending, impulsive giving, um, moved by emotion, moved by feeling. If the project is big enough and exciting enough, then I will do the will and work of God. But if not, you're only functioning on, on the flesh the world definition, if you please, the Webster refining the clarity of the word as the world would see that word love and what it really means. So what I have desire for me and for you is that we would love the Lord, not because of emotion or impulse or feeling, but simply because we've settled in our heart.